Yeah, it was working. It was working. <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's do a little thing. I think it has to come up just a hair. And um, let's do a little study tonight. Uh, let's see, next week, and incidentally, I forgot to tell you, for you folks out there who are watching this four years down the road, forget this, uh, next Sunday night, right here, 7.30, Dave and April will be doing a concert. And many of you saw Jack and Cindy last time, but you've never seen Dave and April. And it's just beautiful. So you really enjoy yourself. Dave and April right now are appearing at the Ocean Sheraton up in uh, Eatontown. And they come to church here. And they'll be here next uh, Sunday evening at 7.30. We'll have a concert. So try to come and bring somebody with you. It's nice when periodically when they... When we have two bands in this church, two professional bands that appear, Jack and Cindy and Dave and April. And, you know, it's nice when they come to bring a crowd out and show them a good time. And then the week after that, I'll be doing a study on how did Jesus feel about reincarnation and quite an eye-opener. Huh? Tonight we're going to do something that I think you'll need a Bible for. A little, little bit of Bible jumping, but it's worthwhile because for me to tell you these things, uh, it's kind of meaningless. For you to see it with your own eyes is uh, extremely important, okay? What ha oh, okay. Here we're going to look at tonight Jesus the Essene, E S S. E N E Jesus the Essene. There was a man named Eusebius. Let me spell that name. E U S E B I U S. Eusebius. And Eusebius uh, was born in Palestine in 265 A.D., about 265 years after Jesus. And he was known as the father of ecclesiastical history. Eusebius. He has tremendous credentials from the most ancient times as to having knowledge about religious history, if you would, ecclesiastical history. He was a chief speaker at the First Council of Nicaea in 325 A.D. And the Bible that you have in your hand is the product of that First Council of Nicaea. So he was the chief speaker at the First Council of Nicaea in 325 A.D. And he raised a tremendous clamor among the bishops and the popes and the cardinals and all of that business that were in that first council because he raised himself from his seat and made the following proclamation. Quote, Our Gospels are actually the sacred writings of the Essenes. That's what he said. Now, I mean, I'm not here to try to convince anybody. That's irrelevant. I mean, what we're talking about, a man who history declares the father of ecclesiastical history, he stood up in the middle of the Council of Nicaea. It's a historical fact. You can check this for yourself. And said, our Gospels were actually the writings of the Essenes. And Eusebius stated that the following writings of the New Testament were definitely the writings of the Essenes. The four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Acts of the Apostles, and Paul's epistle to the Hebrews, he said, were actually written by the Essenes. And that has quite an authority saying that, say. It's not an opinion of somebody who happened to, you know, write in the New Age Journal. I'm talking about a man who was the chief speaker at the Council of Nicaea in 325 A.D. He did a tremendous work, and his whole dedication, Eusebius, was dedicated to one thing, furthering the cause of Christ. He was not somebody trying to disrupt. He was trying desperately to see that Christianity became the way of life of all people. So he, wasn't, he was just saying something that the people never thought of, never understood, and yet he came across and said that our Gospels were the works he, of, of the Essenes. This man was a crusader for Christianity, and you can look his name up in history books and you can read about him. He's not something in a far-off tale that nobody knows whether he lived or not. There were four branches in Hebrew religious structure at that time. There were the Pharisees, there were Sadducees, there were the scribes, and the Essenes. Yet the Essenes are the only ones not mentioned in the Bible. Good reason for that. The Essenes never tried to convert anybody. They stayed to themselves. They were extremely peaceful people. Many of you have heard about the Dead Sea Scrolls and Kwame with the Essenes. Okay. 
The Essenes code of operation was this, order, truth, sobriety, humility, and strict secrecy. They required every person who would be admitted to their group a commitment to secrecy by taking a very solemn oath and by shaving the hair from the head. The Essenes. Let's see that. In order to be a member of the Essenes, you took a very solemn oath not to betray the sacred mysteries to the profane. And when you took that oath, you shaved the hair from your head. And the reason for that was you were saying, I will no longer depend on that aspect of my own mind where this growth is from. In other words, hair to them symbolized that which grew out of the carnal mind. Okay. With that in mind, go to the New Testament, take, a pa uh, take page 131, page 131 in the New Testament. Now, you, your Bible is in two parts. It starts off one to about 600, and then it starts off one again and goes uh, up to, a, uh, you know, whatever it goes up to. But I want you to be in the New Testament, not the Old Testament, okay? Page 131 in the New Testament. And I want you to look with me at the book of Acts, okay? Go to Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18. Now, what did we say about the Essenes? They required a strict oath of secrecy about the mystical things, and then they required you to shave your head as a demonstration that you were one of them and that you would not betray these things to the profane who did not enter within themselves. Acts chapter 18, please go with me to verse 18. And Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while, and then took his leave of the brethren and sailed into Syria with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in Kenshura, for he had a vow. There you go. The apostle Paul, at this point, betrays himself as an ascent and the sect of the Nazarenes, which were of the saints. Now, there's an interesting thing. If you look in Acts 21, which is on page 135, Acts 21 and verse 24. Okay. Paul would take and purify yourself with them, be at charges with them, that they may shave their heads and all may know that those things where, whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing, but you also walk orderly and keeps the law. Shave their head. In other words, the disciples who followed Paul also shaved their head. Okay. So this is the way, this is the way the group of the Apostle Paul moved and worked in religious circles, looking all like a like a Buddhist monk. That's why the monk that's why when you see a Buddhist monk's head is shaved. Now It was after three years of probation of a chaste life, self-mortified, moral, that one was admitted to the order of the Essenes. The Essenes were called by this name, T-H-E-R-A-P-U-T-E, -E, therapeute. And that name means physician. Physician. That's what they were called. They were called therapeute, which means physician. And everything I'm telling you here tonight, you can look up in, in historical records of religion. It's there. Now, go with me, if you would, and let's take a look at Jesus Christ. Page 59 in your New Testament, and it's the book of Luke, and we'll go to Luke chapter 4, okay? What did I just tell you? I told you that the Essenes were called therapeute, and the word therapeute means Greek physician, okay? Now watch this one very carefully because Jesus Christ is going to speak concerning himself. Luke chapter 4, go to verse 23, and this is what Jesus said unto them, You will surely say unto me, this proverb, Physician, therapeute, heal yourself. So Jesus Christ identifies himself by the name by which the Essenes were identified, therapeutic physician. 
The Essenes were originally Buddhists. They originated in India and first appeared in a Jewish religion after the Babylonian captivity. There was no knowledge of the Essenes prior to the Babylonian captivity. After the Babylonian captivity, they appeared amongst the Jews. And you'll now see that the Essenes taught the same precepts as the early Christians. Let's go and take a look. We're going to look at the works of Philo. Do you studied Philo when you were going through your college courses? The great, what would you call him? Philosopher? Greek philosopher? Philo was a tremendous uh, intellect concerning the works of the Essenes. And he wrote of the Essenes. And this is what he said. It is the Essenes' first duty to seek God's kingdom and righteousness. Go with me to page 6 in your New Testament. Go with me to page 6 in your New Testament. The rest go to Matthew 6. Matthew 6. And now come to the words of Jesus Christ in Matthew 6, verse 33. What does Jesus say? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What did Philo say of the Essenes? It is the Essenes' first duty to seek God's kingdom and his righteousness. Now, take a look at this. Philo said the Essenes said this. This was part of their dogma. Lay up nothing on earth. Fix your mind solely on heaven. Go with me. Uh, you're on page 6. Go to page 5. Matthew 6. Okay? Go with me to verse 19. What did Jesus Christ say? Lay up for yourself treasure. Lay not up for yourself treasures on earth. Look at verse 20. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. Coincidence? Coincidence? Don't forget something here. And this is very important for you to know. John the Baptist was an Essene. And Jesus Christ bowed his knee to John the Baptist and submitted to a ritual that had never been done before. It's nowhere in the Old Testament. It's called baptism. And Jesus turned his back on his tradition. He turned his back on the Bible. He turned his back on the law. And he went to this very strange man from the wilderness of whence the Essenes came. And he submitted to that ritual. And he there is using the exact word for word of the teachings that came from the Essenes which originated with Buddha. Now, look at this. Philo said the Essenes, part of the Essenes doctrine was this. You must forsake your family, you must forsake houses, and you must forsake land for the faith of the Essenes. Now, go to Luke 18. It's on page... Uh, Gosh, I think it's 58. I don't know where. Uh, let's see if you can find it. Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke. What is it, 58 or 78? Okay, page 78. Luke 18. Now, here's what, here's what Philo said the Essenes, part of their doctrine is. You must forsake family. You must forsake your houses. You must forsake your land for the faith of the Essenes. Look at Luke 18. Now, look at verse 29. What does he say? Chapter 18, uh, chapter 18, verse 29. Jesus Christ says, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that has left house or parents or brethren or wife or children for the kingdom of God's sake, who shall not receive manifold more in this present time. Word for word. Word for word, Jesus Christ is speaking the doctrine of the Essenes. Philo said that what the Essenes did was they spent their time in silent meditation and inward prayer. Go to Matthew 6. I don't like to keep you jumping around like this, but it's important that you see it. I can just read these off for you, but I don't think it has half the effect. Inward prayer and meditation is what the Essenes did. In Matthew 6, verse 6, what does it say? Page 5 in your, in your New Testament. Jesus Christ says, When you pray, enter in your closet, and when you shut your door, pray to your Father which is in secret. There was an ordinance that the Essenes had. It was never seen before. It was never seen in Judaism. And the ordinance was this. Breaking of the bread. It was totally an Essenian type of ritual. Breaking of the bread. And in Luke 22, verse 19 of Jesus, it said, He took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it. It was Essenian. 
There was another very interesting thing that Philo said. One thing an Essene will never do, he will never call any human being on the face of this earth father or master. Never. Never bow yourself to any man. And what they're saying is, never take into your consciousness that which is instruction from another man. Never. Find for yourself from within. Never say, oh, well, his teaching is right. Never go out of this place and say, Bill's right. You're wrong if you do that. You are only here to hear. The only reason I am here is to help you think and to help you find sources where you can read and you can study and you can pray and you can think because you've got to find this for yourself. What I am showing you tonight is revolutionary and it's violent when it hits the, the years of born-again Christians because they cannot accept sharing this hero that they have with the universe. They can't do that. They can't even conceive that this blessed Jesus Christ had any connection whatsoever with the Shakyamuni Buddha, but he did. Very much so. All of the one, all of, and I'll tell you something that'll shake your, your shiver your timbers here before you get out of here concerning that. And it's a magnificent thing that I excel myself in glorifying what you're going to hear tonight. And I'll tell you when we get to it. I think it's very exciting. But, G but the Essene says, do not ever call anybody master. Do not anybody call anybody father. Never let any human being lord it over you. I don't care what kind of robes they wear. I don't care what kind of gold they wear. They go to the bathroom just like you do, blow your nose just like you do, and do the other things you do too. The only thing is they come out in front of you looking like some archangel that just got off the, you know, close encounters and this. oh my God, they must be holy. They're not. They're not. All the ornate jewels and all the pompous hats and all the stained glass, I told you long ago, the stained glass is only for one purpose, so they can't see the filth and the hurt that goes on outside. Because they break... They should break the stained glass and they should jump out the window and rush to the people that are starving and suffering. Not sitting in there singing, oh, amazing grace, God is blessing me. Go, oh, thank you, God, that you blessed me. The hell with them. We sit down at our Thanksgiving dinner. Oh, thank you, God. We thank you for these gifts while millions of kids and old people are starving to death all over the world. And God's sticking his finger in his eyes. Ah, for cocktail. What? <laughs> what are you thanking me? you down there to help one another, to live with one another, to feed one another, to heal one another. And you're thanking me for the forgot the turkey you got on the, on the table. You should choke on the drumstick or whatever. Matthew, page 24 in the book of Matthew. Matthew 23. Page 24. Matthew 23. Page 24. In the little Bible. Okay? say, why do you get so worked up about this? Because you're, you're hearing the truth, and doesn't it get exciting when finally you've heard the truth, and it makes sense to your head already? The first time, for God's sake, it makes sense. God's going to give you the turkey and let these people start to death. No, he's not. Matthew 23. Look at verses 8. We'll go to verse 8. Be not called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all of you are brothers, and call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. That is an Essenian doctrine. Josephus said this of the Essenes, and of course you know Josephus was a magnificent writer and, 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 and student of those times. Whenever an Essenian goes out to speak, they take nothing with them. They take nothing for the wants of their body. Look at uh, page 68, book of Luke, Luke chapter 10. We're getting, to the, getting rid of most of this, and we won't have to be jumping around so much in just a minute. Luke chapter 10, page 68. Luke chapter 10, and go to verse 4. Jesus' instruction, carry neither purse, nor scrip, nor shoes, and salute no man by the way. Carry nothing with you. Take nothing with you. Do you honestly think that, you know, I have an ability. I understand that. Do you honestly think if I had to depend on this for a living, I would choose this subject? No way. I can do it. I can, I can touch people and make them fall down. I can say you're healed. I can lengthen legs in the wall. I can do that whole thing. I can pack people in here. 
to sing all of the holy songs that pack him and do the whole bit. No problem. No problem. I could have uh, tons of people in here. And that's what I'd have to do if I had to depend on it for a living. I don't. And so I don't have to compromise this. And I'll never compromise it. See? And so, you know, I have my income. I take care of the bride. I take care of the cat, the dogs. Everybody's happy. If nobody comes, we fold the thing up. Say, Vito, sorry, Vito. Close the place. We go to Key West. That's the end of it. But I don't have to tell you a lie so that we can eat. And, and I don't have to, if the spirit moves to change the direction, I'm not going to fly in the same direction if I'm instructed by the spirit simply because I might offend. D don't, I'll tell you something. There was a time these people could sit back. There was a lot of other people here. And when we started saying this, they ran out the door, never to be seen from again. That's the way it is. And I couldn't have dared follow the spirit's lead to do this if my life depended on it or, or, or our blue cross or what. In Matthew, uh, uh, one other thing here, though, before we go on. The Essenes practiced a mystery religion which they shaved their heads and were swore to keep secret. And I want to show you something. Page 13 in your little Bibles, Matthew 13. Matthew 13. Kind of a lot of scripture jumping tonight, but it's important. Matthew 13, verse 11. And look at this. Listen to this. Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. I'm telling you, did you hear what he said? It is not given. Do you understand why these people think I'm a loon? And why these people think I'm running a cult down here? And why they think I'm some kind of an antichrist? Because it is not given unto them. And why isn't it given unto them? Simply because they will not obey Jesus Christ and seek within themselves for the truth. Once a person commits themselves to meditate and seek within themselves for the truth, they'll understand this, they'll come here, they'll have no problem with anything I say. But as long as a person defies Jesus Christ and says, I will not enter within myself, then they'll never know. They'll look at a desert and think it means a desert. They'll look at a white horse and they've got him coming back on a white horse. They have no idea what these things mean. Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Let me show you something. Where did Jesus say the kingdom was? Luke 17, 21. In you. What did he just say? Unto you is given to know the mysteries of yourself. Now you'll have revealed to you the inner workings of this. And you'll be able to deal with yourself and understand yourself. But to those who will not obey it's not given. And they're going to sit themselves in religion. We were talking today. This has nothing whatsoever to do with religion. It has nothing whatsoever to do with the spirituality. It has to do with your learning how to operate this computer you have between your ears. And when you obey these ancients, they're simply telling you, if you will send the electricity, this computer needs to run full blast on electricity that is only available when you meditate. And when that energy rises and it hits the pineal, bang, it's like triggering a spark that sends an energy through here and the computer turns on. That computer which has been dead on the right side, when you meditate, the electronic energy goes up, hits the pineal, and inside it goes, it's on. And the messages start coming through. The information starts coming through. It's totally physical. There is nothing supernatural about it. There is nothing miraculous about it. And if we'll listen, we'll learn how to control ourselves and how to discipline ourselves so the energy goes upwards and turns on the computer. Unto you is given to know, but to them it's not. One thing quite interesting is that the Essenes practiced far outside of Judaism and it totally attached them to the ancients of the East. They, they, they practiced what is called, and let me spell it for you, P-H, no, P, P-A-N-T-O-M, I-M-I-C. Pantominic, pantominic. Pantominic representation. You know what that is? Yeah, I'm, obviously you don't, because I can't even spell it. <laughs> pantominic representation of which the Essenes practice is the death, burial, and resurrection of God. Huh? That's Essenian. The death, burial, and resurrection of God. They introduce scripture through allegory, 
They wrote in parables and an allegory. Galatians 4.24 says the Old Testament is an allegory. Mark 4.34 says Jesus spoke. Without a parable, he didn't say a word. Jesus never spoke except in a parable. And there are people that are taking it literally. Did you ever, did you ever see... How, because I want, did you ever see in the Bible where it says that Jesus never taught without a parable? You didn't. I can see by the way you're staring at me. Come with me to uh, page 37 in the New Testament. Okay? And it's no good for me to tell you this. It's good for you to see it. Go to the book of Mark. Mark chapter 4. All right? You two out there, you get a Bible. And, and people say, what kind of a Bible do you do? I'll tell you what, time you what kind of Bible you should use. Take every revised Bible, every new Bible, international Bible, whatever they are, and throw them away. Throw them as far away from you as you can get them, and I'll tell you why. Because what they're doing, they're taking the mystical language, and they're making it easy for you to understand, but they don't understand it themselves. If somebody says, shoot the bull, they're going to say, well, he got a gun, went out, found a big black animal with horns on it, put a gun in its ear, and pulled the trigger. That's what their revised international version means. Forget it. You get the King James Bible. The reason is it just left the mystical language in it. It didn't change anything. It left it alone. Once somebody says, I got a Bible, it's easy to understand, you're as far away from God as you could ever get. There is nothing easy to understand in no easy way. The King James leaves it alone. There's another good thing about the King James Bible where the translator does not understand what he's supposed to put in. It's written in italics. And you can see it all the way through. He's saying, I don't know what the heck it says in here. But anyhow, he says, I'm putting it in the best I can. Look at, talking about parables, Mark chapter 4. You there? Look at verse 34. Verse 34. But without a parable spoke he not unto them. When they were alone, he expounded all things to his disciples. Do you know what that was mean? That means that everything you read in the Bible is symbolic. And the only way that you can find out what he's talking about is when you go within and be alone with the Christ and he'll explain it all to you. That's why when you sit here, you begin to go out of this room understanding the Spirit, understanding the things of God, because he is giving it to you in this room that you have chosen to come alone. But everything that you're reading is parable. He said it. He doesn't speak without a parable. Look, how many of you read the Old Testament? Go, go to... Um, Go to page 177 in the Old Testament. Uh, no, I'm sorry, in the New Testament. I'm, I'm very sorry. Go, the book of Galatians, the New Testament. Go to Galatians chapter 4. Okay? Are you there? 177 in the New Testament, Galatians chapter 4. And now here is Paul talking about Abraham and Sarah, the Old Testament. Galatians chapter 4, verse 24. How many of you know what an allegory is? An allegory is a story in which you use the names of people and places to represent a mystical spiritual truth. That's what an allegory is. It's a symbolic story. Galatians 4, verse 24. What does he say about Abraham and Sarah? Which things are an allegory? Symbolic. So how can you sit and take it literal? How can it be literalized? The highest aim of the Essene was that their bodies were fit to be temples of the Holy Ghost. And in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, it says, Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. What is this on the side of your head? What is that part of your head called? Look at me. The temple. That's the temple. And when Jesus was driving the money changers out of the temple, he's driving the thoughts out of your head. That's all it means. That's all it means. And there's much more that we could look at that shows that the teachings of Jesus and the teachings of Paul were of the Essenes. And also that the teachings of the Essenes had their origin in, in Buddhism, in India. But there's something very, very interesting that I wanted to share with you. And this is the point. Let's go here. Who were they? Who were the ones that wrote your Bible? This is the interesting point. They're the Essenes. Here are the Christians. When the Christians came, the Essenes disappeared. Like magic. When the Christians appeared, the Essenes disappeared. Gone. Where'd they go? 
the disciples of that order began to call themselves Christians. Up to that time, it seems existed. And in Acts 11.26, it says the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. What were they called before that? What were the disciples called before Antioch? They were called the scenes. That is why Jesus Christ went down to the Jordan River and bowed his knee to the Essenes. Eusebius, the church father, began to feel that, uh, you know, hey, maybe I'm getting out of hand here because he was really starring a lot of clamor. He wanted an acknowledgement in the scriptures that what they were looking at was Essenian and not Christian or not Hebrew. But people were starting to get ruffled by this and then he thought, well, you know, in the Council of Nicaea, he says, gee, if I continue this, maybe, uh, you know, I'm going to cause more people to stray away from Christianity than I'm going to get to sign up for Christianity. So church father Eusebius said the following thing. Whether in the beginning they were called by the name Essenes, when as yet the name Christian was not published, I think it not needful curiosity to sift that. And he dropped it. He didn't pursue it any further. But give it as you may, the principal doctrines and the rites of the Essenes came from India and from Buddhism. And Eusebius said this, these ancient therapeutic were Christians and their ancient writings were Buddhist and they are our Gospels. Whoever told you that? Whoever told you that the writings in your Bible originated in Buddha? This man said it. I mean, he was a lot closer to it than any preacher you've ever seen. He was back in the early days in, 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 in A.D. 325. He said, that's where it come from. The, the Essenes had a flourishing library in Alexandria, Egypt, filled with mysticism. And the first thing that the Christians did with the Crusades is they brought their hordes into Alexandria, Egypt, and they torched the library of Alexandria and up in smoke. All of the mystical teachings went. Everything was destroyed. There was a guy... Another, he was the Bishop of Constantia. He was named as E-P-I-P-H-A-N-I-U-S. The Bishop of Constantia in 367 A.D. made this statement. They who believed in Christ were called Essenes before they were called Christians. Ha! Ah. Uh, is this guy got some credentials? He's the bishop in 367 A.D. He said they who believed in Christ were called Essenes before they were called Christians. You won't have one evangelist will be able to even talk. They'll run like blazes if you say anything like this to them. Because you know what it is? Don't bother me with the truth. They'll say to you, oh, don't get involved in that Eastern stuff. Don't get involved in this uh, Buddha stuff. Don't, I mean, don't listen to any of that stuff. And yet here are documents and here are speakers and here are men of ecclesiastical authority saying, that's where it came from. The book that you have in your hand, that's where it originated. Now here's the interesting part that I think is very exciting and I would share it with you. And why it makes me so good and feel so good to come here. And like on a Sunday morning this morning when we taught of Shakyamuni Buddha and we hail the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. How could you do that? Listen to this. I love it. The Essenes were expecting an angel Messiah for Gautama Buddha. Gautama Buddha said a Buddha angel in human form as a baby would descend from above and would be called the Son of Love. Listen to it. Yes. That's right. I'm telling you, when this stuff comes out, I get these. That was a message from... Uh, are you done? Did you hear that? I mean, you, you know, you might say, oh, I don't know, but... Tony, I mean, you sat right here. And you said, right from outer space to you. Did you hear what I said here? The Essenes were expecting an angel messiah for Gautama Buddha. And Gautama Buddha Shakyamuni said, a Buddha angel in human form would descend from above as a baby and would be called son of love. Do you know something? The Essenes accepted Jesus of Nazareth. I'd like you to write this down. 
because you can look at it, you can look it up, you can document it. The Essenes accepted Jesus of Nazareth as the angel messiah of Gautama Buddha. When that strange young man, the Lord Jesus, walked the face of the earth, he went directly to the Essenes and he submitted himself in the ritual of baptism. And the Essenes looked upon him and the strange Essene John said, he is the one. And therefore the Essenes accepted Jesus of Nazareth as the angel Messiah who had come in physical form of Gautama Buddha. That's exciting to me. Really is. The oneness between those two spirits solidified in absolute love and peace. And Jesus Christ said, if somebody strikes you on the one cheek, turn the other cheek. And Shakyamuni said, a oh, Buddha has no fist. I come with an open hand. That's beautiful. The death, the burial, and the resurrection of God, the coming of the angel Messiah, were as old of the universe, as the universe, Buddha, Krishna, from the most ancient of times. I want you to look at one more scripture. And I won't chase you around the Bible anymore, but I want you to see this. It's on page 187 in your New Testament. For the rest of you, it's in the book of Colossians. Okay? The book of Colossians, which is right after the book of Ephesians or Philippians, I guess. Give you a little time to find it. Go to Colossians chapter 1. Okay? What I wanted to share with you before you look at it is this. Okay? The Essenes knew who this strange Jesus was. Okay? that he was the angel messiah of the Kutama Buddha. He came and he submitted, returning back unto them to receive the water rites. And then went forth preaching this gospel, which had been preached for thousands and thousands of years before. It was nothing new. He was not preaching anything new. If you, hear, if you come here on Friday night, you hear the Bhagavad Gita, you know that Jesus Christ was preaching the Bhagavad Gita, which had been preached 5,000 years before he was born. Now, here's the book of Colossians. And we go to Colossians chapter 1, verse 23. The Apostle Paul says, If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard, and watch this one now, and which was preached, to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Paul uses the word gospel. He is referring to the Essenian gospel. He is not referring to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John because there was no Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John at the time that Paul preached. He is talking of that which is the gospel which had come from Krishna through Buddha, through the Lord Jesus Christ, the everlasting oneness of peace and the inner kingdom, the nirvanic bliss of the creative universal one God. It had always been that way. Paul says, hey, I'm not telling you anything new. This isn't something that just happened 30 years ago. This message which you have heard has already been preached to every living being on the face of the earth. You can call him Buddha. You can call him Krishna. You can call him... Uh, uh, Muhammad, you can call him Jesus. It doesn't make any difference. The message has gone out. Every human being on the face of the earth has heard this message. It is nothing new. The Apostle Paul said, this message that I am preaching is a message that has been preached to everyone who has been under heaven. I'll conclude by um, a statement by a rather contemporary Bible writer named is Dr. David Doan. And he says this, when we read of the Essenes, we are reading of the primitive Christians. And Dr. Doan concludes, as the Christians arrived, the Essenes disappeared. What then can be the conclusion? What the purpose of this message tonight is to bring you into a little closer relationship with your roots. 
to bring you into a little deeper understanding of what your tradition really is and where it came from. To bring you into a much closer appreciation of those who we have considered strange in far distant places. And to bring you in a much deeper appreciation of the oneness of all and the universal essence that is not something new, which is, you know, portrayed as our religion or our Christianity. It is not way at all. What I have told you tonight, you can look in books, history books, church history books. You can look up the statements of Eusebius in church history books. They're there. There's nothing new. And all of these things you should take to yourself and say, has he spoken against the Lord Jesus Christ? I have placed the Lord Jesus Christ as the universal angel messiah of whom the Buddhists recognize. He is the one! Hey! But do you know what's wrong with our, or them, or... We can't deal with that because we don't want to share with them. They call him Buddha. They call him Krishna. We call him Jesus. Who's, you know, in Jesus' name. When is somebody going to wake up? His name wasn't even Jesus. You're going to pray in Jesus' name? Maybe that's why you're screwed up. You got the wrong guy. His name was Jehoshua. There was no, the only Jesus you'll ever find in Puerto Rico. There was no Jesus in Jerusalem. There never was a Jesus in Jerusalem. Never, ever, ever. But the important thing to Christianity is everything is under the name of Jesus. This was his name. Jehoshua. It's a form of the word Joshua. If you walk down the street and saw him and say, hey, hey, hey Jesus. He would never turn around. Because that wasn't his name. But all of the prayers, the whole foundation of Christianity is you must pray in Jesus' name. You got the wrong guy. But that isn't what it means anyhow. When somebody said in the East, and when they still do say, pray in somebody's name or do it in somebody's name, they're saying, do it the way I told you to do it. If you... If I tell you to meditate and you meditate, you're meditating in my name. In other words, you have taken the instruction from me, you're doing it in my name, you're doing it the way I suggested you do it. <coughs> Mentioning somebody's name is irrelevant. What do you think? There's some God up somewhere. Oh, <laughs> he didn't say Jesus' name. <laughs> he ain't getting it. <laughs> okay, let's look over there. I ask it in Jesus' name. Hey, ding. <laughs> okay, let's see. What is this? What kind of lunacy is this? And if you say, I'm mentioning Jesus' name, hey, you hit three sevens. How about this? Mention Krishna's name. Oh, not him. No. It's not the way it is. When you speak, you don't speak in a person's name. You say, I will follow the way that you have instructed. And when you follow the way that has instructed, then Jesus takes you into that place of nirvana. Jesus takes you, takes you into that place of bliss and understanding. That is the Essenian doctrine. That is the Jesus doctrine. That is the Buddha doctrine. That is the Krishna doctrine. The only ones who cannot deal with this are the Christians. Cannot deal with it. Cannot deal with anything Jesus Christ ever said. Cannot deal with the fact that Jesus Christ said, the kingdom of God is within you. Do you know I can sit here and ask each one of you? I could go into any Christian church that would invite me to speak. And I would say to everybody sitting in the audience, wait a minute, folks, I got, good, I got some news for you. How many of you here think you can do better than Jesus? I can't. Just do you think you can do better than Jesus? How about you, Al? You think you can do better than Jesus? Tony, better than Jesus? You know why you don't think you can do better than Jesus? Because you don't believe Jesus. Because he said, the things I do, you can do, and better than me, you can do. Wow! He said it. I said, well, you're, you're, you're a special guy, Jesus. You're a hot shot. I mean, you're on Christmas cards and everything. You know what Jesus said? Wait a minute. Of my own self, I can do nothing. It's the Father within me that does the work, and the Father that's in me is in you. Oh, great. Well, I know one thing. I said in the Bible, I can, I can ask you to come into my heart. You know what Jesus said in the Bible? Don't ask me for anything. Don't ask me for anything. You know why? 
because you can go direct to the Father. You don't have to go to anybody but God. Well, if I, can't, if I can't ask you for anything, at least you can intercede on my behalf, because after all, I, you know what he said? I do not say that I will pray for you. Pray for yourself. Well, how come they didn't tell us that he said not to ask him? Why did they tell us to ask him to come in to our heart when he says, don't ask me for anything? And why do they tell us that he will intercede to the Father when he said he wouldn't? And why do they say he's coming back when he said the kingdom doesn't come to be seen, it's within you? Why do they say all of these things? Okay. And when you look at the Bible, and you can look up those scriptures, my friends, and they're in the Bible, and when you look them up, and you wonder, who have I been following around? I'll tell you who you've been following around. Dun, 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 dun. Them. You haven't been following Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ did not say the things that they said he said. And you sat through 45 minutes or whatever this is tonight and received an understanding that Jesus Christ turned his back on his traditional Hebrew, quote, Jewish tradition <coughs> and submitted to a strange dude down in the wilderness somewhere and was baptized into something that Judaism and the Bible never heard of before. And they said to Jesus, when Jesus came into a church and taught much like was being taught in this place, that all the religious people walked up to him. And you know what they I'm with you. Okay? They said, Hey, Jesus, where do you get off at telling people this stuff? Where do you get the authority to tell people? Where do you see that in the Old Testament? That ain't enough. What you're telling people, the kingdoms within them, cast their net to the right side. Where do you get all that stuff? You know what Jesus said? Ha, I'll tell you what. Make a deal. Let's make a deal. I will tell you where I get the authority from if you tell me where John the Baptist gets the authority to baptize people. They looked in the book nothing in the Old Testament. Where did he get that? We don't know where the heck he gets that from. Well then, pal, you're not going to know where I get mine from. Because in essence, I get it from the same place. You'll never understand where I get this from if you don't understand where he got that from. And as we wrap it up, do you know where he got it from? John the Baptist, Baptist baptized in water, which came from Chaldea. It was a rite and ritual in honor of the god Ea, E-A. And it came down through Buddha. Here's the interesting part. Ea was the water god. Huh? Ea, in Greek, is translated Oannes. The Greek is translated into Latin, I-O-I-O-A, and N-E-S. The I is pronounced J. The Latin is translated into English John. John, the water god, is introduced to Jesus, the fire god. The sun god. That's what came. And it has nothing to do with sticking your head in water. It is simply the progression of the five stages of Greek, earth, water, air, fire, and the new mind. This is what baptism is. When you take the earth, which is your mind, submit it into the truth, which is the directions of meditation, you will come out of the water, rise up to the third stage of consciousness, which is air. Once you have reached that third stage of consciousness, you'll go into the fourth, which is the baptism of fire, or what is known in contemporary Christian circles as the baptism of, Holo uh, baptism of the Holy Ghost, which will give you the renewed mind. That's baptism. And that's what it means. And, and basically, very few today know. People honestly believe, and you're into paganism, you're into superstition, because they believe that if you go and stick your head in the water, something good's in it. It's not going to, it's not what's meant that way. Never. So we begin then to understand these things as we look behind the rituals and we look behind the signs into the truth. Thank you very much.